Good morning, everybody. Not very good. <laughs> Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, it's a beautiful day out there this morning. Great day to be in the house of the Lord worshiping. And uh, we're going to get you all to stand, and uh, we're going to spend some time in the Lord's presence and honoring his name and his beauty. And uh, so we're going to open up in prayer, and then we're going to... We're going to sing a few songs and praise the Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this glorious day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house, Lord, to worship you. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and open our minds to your worship and to your presence, Lord. And uh, as we accept it, in Jesus' name, amen.
How wonderful it is when the house of the Lord worships together. So beautiful.
this microphone so I don't know if I'm using it right but can you hear me yes no maybe kind of not really okay that microphone never likes me but anyways how many people know that Christmas is getting very close anyone okay show of hands who has your Christmas tree up full honesty Oh, this side of the church, you're my people over here. Yes, I will not tell you how long we've had our tree up, but it's been a while. Uh, so next question, how many people here know Christmas can be a little bit expensive? Anyone know that Christmas can be expensive? Okay, third question, how many people here, show of hands, be honest, spend more than $50 during the month of December? Okay, that's what I thought. So this year as a church family, we are doing a new initiative called the Christmas Care Packages. And the reason I asked you if you spent more than $50 is because one of these care packages is gonna cost us $50 to complete. So we have so many people in the Clarenville area who are in need at this Christmas season. We opened our applications last week and we already have almost 80 families and singles who've applied for these packages. So we know that our sisters and brothers at the Salvation Army do an amazing job of providing families with toys and turkeys, which we all want, but we also want to provide families with the essentials that they need, things like toilet paper, things like toothpaste, laundry detergent, that you would be surprised how many people in the Clarenville area can't afford these things on a weekly basis. So we, they are costing us about $50 for one package, give or take. And so we want to put the challenge out to you as a church family. You can choose, and I know some of you have already brought along toiletry items, but maybe you're busy like me and you just want to say, Pastor Julia, here's $50 to fill a package or 100 or 5,000. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, maybe you want to take some time to pray, to think, to ask yourself, how many packages, how many families can we help this Christmas? And we are aiming to help 100 families and singles in the Clarenville area this Christmas. I've been on the phone all week, and let me tell you, I am a firm believer that when we meet people's needs, we are being the hands and feet of, of Jesus, and that people don't want to listen to what we have to say when they don't have shampoo. 
or a toothbrush or fruit to feed their kids over the Christmas season. So we are being the hands and feet of Jesus in this way, and we are believing that God is going to bless this to provide for families, but also to show them the love of Jesus in a real way this season. So I know that you're going to partner with me. I know you are because some of you already have, but I wanted to make sure you know about it, make sure that you check how much you have in your wallet now and bring it, no, I'm joking. But we want to make sure that we are able to help as many families as we can this season. We're so excited about it. It's an amazing opportunity. If you'd like to help with packing those packages, maybe you don't have money to spare, you can also help us do that. And if you need a package, you don't need to raise your hand, but talk to myself or Pastor Andrew, maybe someone in your family does, and we would love to connect you with that. So are you with me? Lydia is with me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, Pastor Andrew's gonna come with some more announcements in a while, but right now I'm gonna hand the service back to Louie and we're gonna continue to worship together. I always wanted to buy shampoo for somebody. <laughs> this is my, my goal for this Christmas is to buy shampoo for somebody. <laughs> we're gonna move into a quieter time of worship this morning. And uh, there's something to really think about, you know, less fortunate and, and we always think the less fortunate are in some other country but there are less fortunate in our province in our town in our church and uh, we need to be mindful of that and, uh, like pastor julia said we need to work together so that we can uh, provide solutions for those people who are in need
you. Today we say that you are the faithful one, the one who's from the beginning to the end, the one who takes care of us, the one who has concern over us, the one who says he is our good shepherd, who takes us through every valley, every time of darkness, every hardship, every unexpected turn. I thank you, Lord, that the scripture says that you are our shepherd whose rod and your staff, your very presence in the midst of our chaos gives us comfort. Lord, you've promised us never to leave us nor forsake us. You've promised to be with us always to the end of the age. You've promised to clothe us in your righteousness and gird us with your strength and power. You say to us, it's not by our own ability, not by our own strength, but by your spirit are things able to be done. And so, Lord, today we submit ourselves to your precious Holy Spirit, which moves to and fro and ministers in the hearts of men, women, teenagers, and children today. Holy Spirit, we open our lives and the situations that we face, we open them up to you. We know that you are able to do more than what we can do. We know there are things beyond our ability, but Holy Spirit, you can do it today. So Father, we remember the many needs brought to our attention. We think of a man named Dion today, who's needing God to minister to his situation, minister to his body. We think of another man in Alberta today, Jamie, who God, the doctors are trying their best, but nothing seems to be working. Lord, we are calling on you, our heavenly doctor, our great physician, to do something beyond what medicine can do. We think of the community of Clarenville today that is going through such a period of mourning and loss within our community. Oh, Father, would your Holy Spirit that brings peace and comfort and strength, would it find those hearts today that are hurt and broken? Lord, your word tells us that you heal the brokenhearted and you bind up their wounds. And so, Lord, I ask by the power of your spirit, you would do that today. Father, in this room this morning and those who will watch online, there are many needs. God, people needing the Lord to minister to their bodies, to their family, to their situation. Maybe there are people today not sure how they're going to make it to next week. Things aren't going the way they thought they would. Lord, today, in the darkness of that confusion, in the darkness of that doubt, we rest on your unchanging grace. The grace that has saved us, the grace that is changing us, and Lord, that grace that will lead us home. So Lord, we rest upon your grace today, asking you by the power of your spirit, you would minister and work in our lives. Bless our time, the remainder of this. Lord, we are so thankful for your presence in this place. Bless us now for the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. At this time, we'll dismiss the kids to their kids' program and uh, let them go out. So if you are anywhere from 0 to 12, I guess, uh, grade 5, grade 6, you're able to go. We have a spot just for you. And, of course, the nursery is open as well. But the only thing is you can't leave if you don't like the preaching, all right? You can't go in the nursery. Brother Boyce, this microphone is working okay? Perfect. A couple of quick announcements before we get into... The, uh, the sermon today, first of all, I want to say it's so good to see you. Some of you this past few weeks haven't been out because of sickness or a variety of different things. It is really good to see you. And I see that you're smiling. Most of you. Some of you. Two of you. Really good to see you. We've had a fantastic week in the Lord. We've had a great prayer service. We had a wonderful time at the Manna Cafe. And uh, we have one more in November, then one last one in December. And uh, we had a phenomenal time Wednesday night with the Special Olympics here at the church. Uh, maybe you saw some of those pictures, and may, or maybe you helped volunteer. What a great time. I just love those precious people. They, they're my people. They like my kind of food. Pizza and craft dinner. Wow. That's what they wanted, and I thought, awesome. And Bobby was so proud, and Luke was so proud to have all their friends here in the church. And we had a great time. And looking forward to having them uh, in the new year again, sometime again. A couple of quick announcements. Hopefully when you came in, the usher passed to you a long piece of paper that looks like this. 
It is our calendar for December. If they didn't pass one to you, they're fired, all right? <laughs> no, but if you don't have one, please get one after the service. And it has all of the events happening in December. Now, I know you say, Pastor, we're only about you know, three quarters of the way through November. I understand that, but December is busy. And we want to make sure you know what's happening. Uh, there are some regular programs and routines that will continue throughout the schedule. And sometimes there will be some special events happening here at the church or elsewhere. So please be mindful of that. You are welcome to all of those events, all of those things. But please be mindful of those events. Want to let you know the church board, and I wasn't even part of this conversation. So you need to know this right up front. I wasn't part of this conversation. But the church board has decided because Christmas and New Year's Day lands on the Sunday, there'll be no service on those Sundays. And so there'll be no Christmas, ser Christmas Day service or New Year's Day service. And we will return on January. But when we return in January, we won't be coming back to this building. We will be at the East Link Event Center. So Christmas Eve will be the last event or last service that we have in the present configuration of this building. And so uh, I'm thinking about getting everyone to write their name on the wall when they leave or something. I don't know. But, uh, but just be mindful of that, different events. And you see them in the calendar. And so be aware of that. Um, I don't think there's any other announcements. Oh, one more thing I would like to say is uh, we, last week a, a new ministry started in the church on Monday nights called Grief Share. And this past week was their first meeting together. It's about 13 weeks. And you can join at any point in those 13 weeks, just so you know. If you missed this first one, you're not, you, know, you can't come to the other ones. You can join. But uh, Pastor Julia was there. I know Pastor Mrs. Hines were there as well, and many others in our church. They had a phenomenal time together. And Grief Share is a ministry that's designed not to fix anybody, but to help people and give them the tools if they had gone through a traumatic loss, gone through a loss of a loved one, or and it might have been recent, or it might have been a long time ago. And so if you have gone through this hard valley of someone passing away, you know that grief doesn't turn on one day and turn off another day. Things happen, especially this time of year, the memories and things can cause you to feel overwhelmed. And so this program is being run by Elizabeth Wilcox and Jennifer London, two wonderful ladies who know the feeling that you're feeling. And so I really encourage you, if you've been on the fence, I'm not sure if I should go, is it for me? How about you come? Tomorrow night, I believe it's 7 o'clock, here at the church, Grief Share, and it's going to be a wonderful time. And because it's called Share, it doesn't mean you've got to share and, and tell your story. You can just come and listen and take it in. But I would really encourage you, if that is something you've been thinking about or wondering about, I would really encourage you to come because it is important to do that, all right? Important to take care of your, your heart and your emotions in that way. And so I want to put that plug. I'm also really happy to announce that our family is growing. Uh, Pastor Julia and I and Levi and Lydia, uh, we got a new fish. <laughs> you all thought I was going to say she was having a baby. I'll tell you right now, if Julia is pregnant, I have gone missing. And I am somewhere up behind White Hills. We have a new fish in the family. Levi called him Finney. But he wanted to name them all. So his name is Finney Levi William Maxwell Ball. But his nickname is Salt and Finnegar. New fish. And so uh, we're excited about that. But I had you there for a moment. You got excited. We're finishing up our series today on the book of 1 Thessalonians. If you have your Bible, could you turn there with me? Chapter 5. We're going to read starting in verse 12 and work our way down to the end of the chapter. This is the, this is the end of this book, this letter, this first letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. Now, as you know, as we've been going through this series, if you followed in person or online or you got bits and pieces, this is one of Paul's first letters he has ever written to the church. Some say Galatians, some say 1 Thessalonians. They were written around the same time. They share some similar thoughts. But we need to recognize that this is a real letter going to real Christians who are facing real problems and want to have a real faith. And so as Paul writes to them, 
It's very interesting. We've called this series The Hope of His Coming. All throughout, in every portion of this letter, he once again reorient, reorientates or, or, or reminds them that everything we do and everything we are is caught up in the fact that Jesus is coming soon. And therefore, we must live a certain way. We must ask the Holy Spirit to shape us and form us that we might be ready for His return. And so we have been spending seven Sundays on this. Of course, there were a couple Sundays in between where I wasn't here and we didn't do this series. But, but we've been spending lots of time looking at this small book, one of the smallest books of the New Testament. But so much to say. And we've worked through the concept of, of the rapture. We've worked through the idea of living a life that pleases God. And now today we're going to finish up. And I want to look at the last few verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's going to be on the screen as well. And uh, I'm going to read it with you today. And your Bible translation may be slightly different, but they all say the same message. Or they should say they all have the same message. But let's read it. It says, We ask you, brothers, to acknowledge those who labor among you and are appointed over you in the Lord and instruct you. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brothers, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak, and be patient toward everyone. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Examine all things. Firmly hold unto what is good. Abstain from all appearances of evil. May the very God of peace sanctify you completely. And I pray to God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he mentions the coming. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now turn to your neighbor. No, I'm just joking. I command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the holy brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That word amen, of course, means let it be. So be it. May it happen. These last few verses of 1 Thessalonians is really interesting to me. Paul seems to address a lot of things near the end of this letter. Almost as if he's running out of ink or running out of paper. He got to get everything in now because he knows he only has this much left and so he's just putting, do this, do this, do this, be mindful of this, do this, kiss each other, da 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 da, right? You know, it, 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 it seems kind of like he's trying to fit everything in the letter because again, this is a real letter. This, this is a real letter to real people who he's trying to instruct. Because the Apostle Paul, as you might remember from our sermons, went and started the church in Thessalonica. He was only there about four or five weeks, and he had to leave again. And he left some people in charge, and he got to a point, he got to Athens, and he, he was so worried about these young Christians, he sent Timothy to give a status report. He couldn't call them on the phone, he sent someone. And Timothy went there, observed it all, came back to Paul, and said, Paul, Things are going well. This is what's happening. And these are a few of their questions. These are the things they're struggling with. And Paul writes them a letter. And of course he addresses it. Some of them, they struggle with what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes back. That was a big question they had. Paul addresses that. So as he comes to the end of this letter, this real letter, he's trying to address a few more things and get it done. Because he doesn't want confusion to happen. It's very easy to get confused from a letter. I heard about a grandma who opened up a letter one time from her daughter and started to cry. And her husband came in, grandpa came in, and he said, dear, dear, what's wrong? She said, oh no, she said, our grandson, Tim, our grandson, oh, it's so terrible. He has, a, he has another foot, he has three feet. 
My daughter is right. He has three feet. And he said, what are you talking about? Well, she said, our daughter wrote us a letter and said our grandson grew another foot. <laughs> Confusion. Not three feet. He got taller. Easy to be confused. That's like the little boy writing a letter to his grandma. He was writing a letter. His mom came in his room, saw the letter, and she said, I see you're writing a letter to grandma, but why are you just writing in such big letters? You're using all the paper. You're writing in such big letters. And the boy said, well, mom is like this. Grandma's very deaf, so I'm writing very loud. <laughs> this is a letter. And so what is Paul trying to do as he concludes it? Well, he touches a bunch of issues, speaks in a bunch of subjects. And when I look at this, when you look in your Bible, maybe your Bible breaks them up. Many times scholars will break up all these verses in different categories and give different titles and different things and try to organize it. And that's fine. That's a good method. It's important for us to understand. But when I look at these last few words from Paul to this letter, I see two things. First of all, I see almost like Proverbs. Paul is giving them wise advice, wise sayings to help them in their faith. I mean, think about this section here, right? Rejoice always. That's a statement. That's a wise saying. Pray without ceasing. That's a wise saying. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. That's, it's like a proverb. He's giving wise sayings to the church, things to put in their back pocket to remember so that they might live a life honorable and ready for the Lord. But not only that, when I look at this, from verse 12 to the end, to verse 28, not only do I see wise sayings, but I, I see Paul almost describing someone. He's describing someone, and I think that Paul is giving a description of his friend Barnabas. And today, for a few moments, I want us to consider the fact that our calling as Christians, the best thing that we can be called inside the house of God and outside the house of God is Barnabas. The best thing we can be called is a Barnabas. Now you say, Pastor, why do you say that? Well, I'll tell you why. In the book of Acts chapter 4, it's the first time we read about a man named Joseph of Cyprus. In Acts chapter 4, we're told that he is a Levite Jew who came to faith in Jesus. And he was so changed by the gospel. The message of Jesus Christ changed him so much that Joseph sold a piece of property that he owned, took all the money from that sale, and brought it to the leaders of the New Testament church, and gave them every nickel and dime, because we don't have pennies no more, <laughs> gave them all the nickels and dimes, everything, to the apostles, so that the poor and the widows of the church could be cared for. And we read in Acts chapter 4, that because of his attitude, because of his actions, Joseph of Cyprus was given the nickname Barnabas. Barnabas. Which means, the Bible tells us, son of encouragement. The one who encourages. The Greek of it actually means the one who helps you do the right thing. It's very interesting, and this will be an interesting sermon sometime, maybe a Bible study, to look at all the nicknames given to the people in the Bible. For example, Thomas. That's not his real name. Thomas was the word to describe a twin because he looked like one of the other disciples. They were so similar, they called one by the real name and called the other one the twin. It's like, almost like, this is Junior, right? <laughs> well, we see here that he has given this name, this title, this nickname, Barnabas. I won't tell you the nicknames I had in school. <laughs> Barnabas becomes a really important and influential leader in the New Testament church. You know, it was actually Barnabas who went to Damascus and found Paul after he had this amazing encounter with Jesus Christ. Paul, after this encounter with Jesus, is totally changed. And he starts preaching because of what had happened. And Barnabas goes down, takes Paul, and brings him back to the leaders in Jerusalem and says, listen, this guy is legitimate. We can vouch for this guy. He is good. He is good for our church. He will do well for the kingdom of God. And he shows respect and honor to leaders by coming to them and saying, Listen, this guy who was once persecuting you is genuinely changed. 
we see that Barnabas was the one that the church in Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem was the very first church. It was the first church, the main church, the mother church that sent people out. And they heard that in Antioch, a revival had broken out. People were becoming followers of Jesus in another place called Antioch in Syria. And they were concerned. What's this all about? So we need to send someone. And who do they send? They send Barnabas. He goes to the city of Antioch to take it all in, to give a report. And we read in Acts chapter nine, 11 sorry, that when Barnabas arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and extorted them all to remain with the Lord with a loyal heart. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and many people were added to the Lord. We see that later on in the book of Acts, Barnabas was trusted and given the responsibility with his friend Paul to bring support and encouragement to Christians in Judea who were about to go through a terrible famine. We likewise read that Barnabas, along with Paul, ministered among the churches in the area. Wherever they were, they were ministering among the Christians, encouraging them, teaching them, helping them live in a manner worthy of the gospel. It was Barnabas and Paul who were sent as the first missionaries from the New Testament church to different places in the Roman Empire. It was a direct response. Barnabas's ministry was a direct response to the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. It says in Acts chapter 13, As the leaders in Antioch worshipped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, also known as Paul, for the work to which I have called them to do. They were a dynamic duo. Now, unfortunately, we read in the Bible that Barnabas and Paul would actually eventually split up. They were an amazing, dynamic duo for the Lord. They were great in ministry together. But they got to a disagreement about whether to give someone a second chance. You see, what had happened is that Barnabas had a nephew named John Mark. And John Mark went with them on a missionary journey one time. And in a really important moment in this missionary journey, when Barnabas and Paul needed John Mark the most, they were going through persecution, it was tough, they were thinking about going home, and John Mark leaves them, he deserts them, and goes back home with his mom. That's a true story. And it makes Paul mad. So when they're going out for their second missionary journey, Barnabas says, let's take John Mark again. I really believe he deserves a second chance. And Paul says, no way, not happening. We are not taking him again. And they become such, so divided over this, such a disagreement, that they decide to split up their team. And Barnabas takes John Mark and goes on a missionary journey. And Paul takes a young man named Silas and goes on a missionary journey. Now, unfortunately, we are not told how the story ends for Barnabas. Did they ever reconcile? Did him and Paul ever get together and say, listen, we are wrong and we should fix this? We know from the Bible, in the New Testament letters that Paul writes, that John, Mark, and Paul reconciled. He was restored. They, they, they fixed their relationship. And it, every indication means that most likely Barnabas did as well. There's actually a mention of Barnabas in the, in the book of Colossians that seems to suggest that they reconciled. And, and we don't know from the Bible how Barnabas died or when he died. Church history tells us he died maybe five or six years before Paul. He was, the church history says he was killed for his preaching of the gospel in Syria. Now, I share all that about Barnabas, the son of encouragement, because when I read through this last few pieces of advice, when Paul is ending this letter to the church in Thessalonica, it comes to my mind that he might have been writing about someone. He might have thought about someone and said, wow, if we could only be like this, in hard times, in good times, in fat times, in lean times, if we could be like a Barnabas, if we could be sons of encouragement. And so as I go through this this morning, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and I will provide it for you after the service if you like one. But I want to talk today, just for a few moments, about what it takes to be a person of encouragement. Because I think the best thing we can be called is to be called people who encourage. Sons and daughters of encouragement. Encouragement is more than just simply saying, you can do it. Encouragement means a lot more. Encouragement means to support, to correct, to want the best for. 
like that Greek word perichalesis, to do the right thing. I want to be known at the end of my life, whenever that will be. I don't care if they talk about my preaching or my handsome good looks or my beautiful singing voice. I heard, heard someone this week at, at, at the funeral, Pastor Brush, talk about their singing voice and how they said, yes, I'd like to hear you sing on a hill far, far away. <laughs> That's like me. When I first started, Pastor Primer a couple months ago said to me, I listened to your service. He said, you got much better at singing. <laughs> Thank you, I think. At the end of my life, the best thing that can be said about me was, I was a good dad, good husband, and a person of encouragement. Because my desire is that you, despite the hardships, despite the setbacks, that you make it. That you don't throw in the towel. That you let God make you to be all he has designed you to be. Paul even says in the book of Thessalonians, my greatest joy is to see you when Jesus comes again. That's the reward for us. So, let's look at this. We're going to work down through it. And uh, I can give you a copy of this later if you like one. If you don't, that's fine. But um, I want to talk about things that encouragers do. And maybe today I want to convince you that I want to be a person, a son or a daughter of encouragement. Encouragers give, honors, give honor to leaders. They look to, for ways to support and work alongside church leadership. Now, I find this awkward to speak about this today. Because I am in church leadership. But church leadership is more than just someone who stands behind a pulpit. Paul actually says, honor those who work, who labor, who toil alongside with you. This, in this includes volunteers. This includes board members. This includes anyone who is working for the betterment of the gospel in your midst. To give them honor. Encouragers think highly of leaders. They carefully consider... If your next critical comment about those who work in the church or work with the church is fair and necessary. Good friend of our family this past week passed away and I was watching their, their service. And, and the parish priest said that this individual, his first meeting of him was the individual came up to him and said, Preacher, I liked it today, but here are some things I would change. And he, and he spoke to him. And now the pastor, priest said, listen, that wasn't a bad thing. It was a good thing. He made me a better pastor because of his honest help. There is such thing as constructive criticism. There is such thing as being said, listen, you know, I, I noticed this in you, and we've got to be careful about that. But in the church of Christ, we don't need, we need constructive people, but we don't need critical people. We're all trying to do our best here. So carefully consider if your next comment is fair and necessary, think highly of leaders. An encourager genuinely loves the leadership in church. They express their appreciation by thanking them and for their efforts. An encourager does whatever they can to avoid quarreling and fighting. They search for ways to get along with others. An encourager challenges those who refuse to listen to wisdom. To, to, they challenge them. Listen, you're not listening to wisdom. You're, you're ignoring it. You're being unruly. And what you can do with that, well, they invite people to walk alongside of them. An encourager comforts those who are frightened and anxious. Verse 14 talks about that, that he encouraged them who deal with fear. Many people deal with fear. You'd be surprised at the people who say, I'm afraid. You'd be surprised at the people who, when you're not looking, may be having a panic attack because they're overwhelmed and anxious. You'd be surprised. Uh, an encourager knows that the promises of God are the remedy to fear. To be reminding other people that God has not forgotten them. Encouragers take care of the weak and the sick. You know, you support them by praying for them, thinking about them. Do you know that one of the distinguishing marks of the New Testament church when it began was that we did not cast our weak and sick aside? It was, it was common in culture. If anyone was blind, if anyone was broken, if anyone was sick, if anyone was a widow, if anyone was weak, well, too bad for you. You're only holding us back. But the church said what Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are sick, 
All you who are weak, all you who are overwhelmed, all of you who feel you just can't do it, come unto me and I will give you rest. An encourager doesn't turn the weak and the sick away, but they pray for them. They think about them. They do what they can to help them. An encourager practices patience, like I was trying this morning in the seat. <laughs> Hallelujah. They think of a situation beforehand. Maybe sometimes an encourager can foresee a conflict. And, 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 they, and they think about that and they say, well, how can I prepare my patience for this? How can I prepare for this and stay calm? An encourager resists revenge. That kind of sounds basic, doesn't it? To avoid revenge, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But you'd be surprised in the moments when you want an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. An encourager doesn't do that. Instead of planning to get even, we plan to do good. Play a different game. I love, I was reminded a couple weeks ago that about three years ago, or four maybe now, time has gone so fast with COVID. Have you heard about COVID? Um, I, something going on. Uh, but time has gone so fast with it. Uh, several years ago, there was a big situation with the indigenous people in New Brunswick and, and Nova Scotia uh, when it comes to lobster fishing and, and fishing the offshore, and James, you might remember this, and the fishermen were going and cutting all their nets and they were destroying their pots because the, the indigenous had this law that allowed them to fish any time, and the other, they were all mad. And so the indigenous people, instead of retaliating, played a different game. And you know what they did? They bought the merchants. They bought the company that buys all the seafood. So instead of cutting the pots and cutting the nets of the other fishermen, they bought the whole business. And so now if you want to deal with us, you've got to sell to us. And we'll buy from you. And I thought, that's genius. Because it's easy to cut someone else's net. Isn't it? It's easy to go off and say, well, you cut my net, I'll cut yours. But play a different game. Go above and beyond. We're called to do good. We're called to bless those who persecute us. Resist revenge. An encourager is joyful. Rejoice always, he said. I am convinced that joy, not only joy here, but joy, is a direct descendant of remembrance. When you stop and think about all that God has already done for you, just stop and think about that for a moment. Think about where He found you. Think about how He helps you. Think about that time he did something for you that no one else could do. That's enough to praise the Lord for all of eternity. That's enough to be joyful. He doesn't say you've got to be happy all the time because he knows that's impossible. But to be joyful is to know that God loves me. Is to know that even in difficult times, God is still in control. To know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? forever. The Bible never calls us to always be happy, but it calls us to be joyful. The scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The scripture says restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Be joyful. An encourager is a person who recognizes, like, I have met people who think that because they are a Christian they can't go through a difficult time. Even when it happens, they simply have to ignore it. We got the victory. We got the victory. Yes. But you also know that Psalm 23 says, Even though I walk through that valley. It doesn't talk about the mountaintop. It talks about the valley. You're still with me. There can still be victory in your soul, in the dark night of the soul, because you are joyful. An encourager has a living prayer life. Some of us treat our prayer life like Levi treats Lucky Charms. I have a bit every morning. But a living prayer, he says, pray constantly or without ceasing. Now all throughout church history, this has been interpreted 101 ways. At one point, there were monks that all they did in the, in the monastery was pray all the time. That's how they interpreted. But I really believe Paul is speaking about having a living prayer life. To know that when you're walking through Walmart and you see someone and you think, Lord, I pray for them. 
Bless them. Help them. I know what they're going through. Oh, when you're cooking your supper or washing the dishes or in church, it's a living prayer life because you know the God that walks through you through every valley also listens to you through every valley. We need to demystify prayer. Prayer is not something we only do in this building. Prayer is not something we only do before we eat a good meal or a bad meal, depending on where you are. Prayer is talking and walking with Jesus. That's prayer. A living prayer life. An encourager knows that they can pray at any time. And they pray just like they are. An encourager is thankful. An encourager evaluates their life and recognizes the many blessings. Again, this is connected to joy. The blessings and to give thanks to God. Like, I have any friends now that are preparing for American Thanksgiving. And they're getting all ready for this. And we've already had our Canadian Thanksgiving. But thankfulness is not a one time a year thing. It's to recognize our blessings. To recognize our burdens. And still yet in the midst of that, lift their hands and say, Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you for how you're helping me through. Then Paul moves on to the spiritual aspects of this again. He says, An encourager doesn't smother the fire of the Holy Spirit. When Paul says that in verse 19, Do not quench the Spirit, he's talking, the image there is putting out a flame, to, to put out a candle. To snuff it out, to doubt it out, like the Newfoundlanders was like, doubt it out. Well, we are not called to smother the Holy Spirit, but we're called to cooperate with the Spirit when He prompts us. You know what? An encourager is someone who feels the Spirit speak to them and wants to say yes. Whether it's in a service, whether it's you know, by yourself, whether it's wherever you are, they hear the Spirit and they want to say yes. I don't know about you, if you're a parent, maybe you feel like this, but the easiest word for me to say as a parent is no. Can I do this? No. How about this? No. How about this? No. It just rolls off my tongue now. I even know it in French. No. <laughs> I think sometimes the easiest things to say in a church service when the Spirit is speaking to you is no. But a son or a daughter of encouragement says yes. Because they know that when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, rarely is it just for me. Many times he speaks through the church for the church. I mentioned this a few weeks ago in prayer service. If you haven't come to prayer meeting, you're missing out. I really want to say that to you. You are missing out. We've been having some... Amen, Bobby, that's right. We've been having some phenomenal times of prayer. And it's not pressured. It's genuine prayer. We take time to worship. I take time to teach from the Word of God, and then we pray. And sometimes we pray in our seats, sometimes we're at the altar. It's a genuine moment with God. And a few weeks ago in prayer service, I said to those that were present, I said, listen, we're talking about the altar times we've been having in church. And we said, if in the service you feel prompted, the Spirit speaks to you to go to someone else in the worship service and say, the Lord wants me to encourage you or pray with you right now. Can I do that? I said, that doesn't bother me one bit. I would love that. I would love in a worship service to see brother so-and-so get up and walk over to someone else and sister so-and-so get up and say, listen, you, the Lord got me on your heart. You're on my heart this morning. I want to pray with you because that is what the body of Christ is supposed to do. It's not about coming in and listening to a few songs, listening to a fantastic preacher, and then, and then going home. It's not that. The point of coming together is that we come in God's presence together, holding hands, with our hands lifted high, with praise and worship, and we're here, and sometimes it's amazing. I, I can't share this story yet, but this past week, something happened in the prayer service no one else knows about except me and this other person. A genuine God moment. Why? Because I wanted to say yes. But on the flip side of that, if you've been around Pentecostal circles or charismatic circles for any time, you might have encountered, <gasps> I don't know if that's God. I won't look at anybody here this morning. <laughs> I don't know if that's God. We've all encountered that. 
And this is what happened in the, in the Thessalonian church. It was a bit charismatic. And, and so it got to the point, church history tells us, that the leaders of the church said, no more Holy Spirit prophecies, no more tongues and interpretation, no more standing up and saying, God says, no more of that. Because it was being abused. But Paul says, encouragers don't roll their eyes at the Holy Spirit. They don't turn it away. They want to listen to the Spirit, but they want it to be genuine. The church of Jesus Christ is called to weigh what is happening. It is not unspiritual. It is spiritual. In the midst of the church, if a charismatic moment happens, if someone stands up with the tongues and interpretation, or a word of encouragement, or a word of prophecy, or a word of knowledge, it is spiritual for us to say, Lord, is this you? My grandmother told me, my great-grandmother actually told me before. She said, Andrew, you will know when it's real. You will know when it's real. And I have had those encounters where we know it's real. And there's also been times when I've been in places where I think that is not what God is saying to the church. So Paul says, encouragers, they don't roll their eyes at the Holy Spirit. and They want to listen to his guidance. They don't want to despise. They say, Lord, use me any which way do you want to use me. But at the same time, they're not gullible. Because if they want to be used by God, they want to be used by God. That's where I want to be. I don't want to be used by you. I don't want to be used by my emotions. I don't want to be used by my, my own feelings. I want to be used by God. So I say yes. Holy Spirit, whatever you want me to do. Encouragers keep away from evil. They avoid situations where they're tempted to live below the calling that God has on them. That's an important part. I want to remind you today that God has a calling on your life. If you are a born-again Christian, if you've committed your life to Christ, you are a child of God. And no one can take that away from you. You can pass back in that card and say, no, no, thank you, I'm not staying with this. But no one can take it from you. I'm sorry, Pastor Hines, you can't take my sonship and I can't take your sonship. Hallelujah. So therefore, because I'm a son of God, or you might be a daughter of God, we're all children of God, we have to live according to what he calls us to do. And so many people are tempted to live beneath that calling. And the Paul says, Stay away from evil. Stay away from that temptation. Don't ever let it to drag you down. I, I have a sermon I want to preach sometime. Pastor Hines, you might have preached it before. That every time Samson went down to Philist Philistines, he went down. Never up to Philistine, down to Philistine. Sin will always bring you down lower than what your calling is. It's a good sermon. Encouragers count on God's help to make them holy. They accept that the Christian life is not lived out in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Friend, I'm not perfect yet. You're not perfect yet. But one day, Paul says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to perfection, to completion. There will be a day when you are perfect. It's just not yet. I'm sorry. Encouragers trust God to do what He's promised. We need to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to shape our lives and to remind us of God's promises. An encourager is a person who likes to pray. He says in verse 25, he says, Brothers, pray for us. There's a difference in having to pray and liking to pray. Raise your hand today if this week or I'll say, let me be safe, this year you've had to cook. This year you've had to cook. Raise your hand if you had to cook. This year, something. Even if it's in the microwave, you had to cook. Some of you haven't eaten all year, looks like. <laughs> you had to do it. You had, if it wasn't for you cooking, you would have not had a meal. Okay, yeah, I see that hand, hallelujah. I see it. Now, raise your hand if you like to cook. Ah, there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference. When you have to cook, you just have to do it to get it done. When you like to cook, it's an experience that I am willing to try any time, by the way. We are not called, encouragers don't have to pray. They like to pray. They like the fact that no matter where they are, they can say, Lord, you're with me, 
and I need this. Lord, you're wonderful, and I give you glory. And they like to pray for those in the church. An encourager truly loves the family of God. Verse 26, it says this, Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. It's so funny to me. One translation I read this week, <laughs> he said, shake all the hands. <laughs> That's how they interpreted that verse. Don't kiss anybody. Shake the hands. <laughs> Now, that's cultural. In the Middle East, you'll still see people who greet each other and they will kiss on the cheeks. If you try that somewhere here in the Avalon Mall, you might be arrested. <laughs> but Paul is emphasizing that you need to show your love and connection with the family of God. Shake a hand. Some people are huggers, high-fivers, whatever it is. You show your connection to them. Encouragers truly love the family of God. Verse 27 says this, I command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the holy brothers, or all the Christians. An encourager is willing to share God's wisdom and guidance. Some of you have this saying that's so true, it says, I'm blessed to be a blessing. Have you heard that before? I have been blessed to be a blessing. Well, let me say that that also applies to what the Lord is saying to you and speaking to you in your devotional time, in times of prayer, in times of worship. We're not called to keep the good news to ourselves. We're called to share it. It's amazing how a timely word can change a situation. I still talk about this and, 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 and chess war, I can't find that little piece of paper. That night you gave me garbage in the board meeting. It was a Hall's wrapper and he, he was having a cough that night. <laughs> And Chess gave me his garbage. A little small piece of garbage written on it that says, there's nothing you can't handle. And I felt like I was over my head in this situation. And it was a timely word through a hall's garbage. <laughs> Maybe we need to start giving garbage to other people to remind them there's nothing they can't handle. That with Christ all things are possible. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Don't grow weary in doing good, but if we keep up, we will surely reap a harvest. We are called to share the word of the Lord with our families. So I know that seems like a lot. I listed off, oh, close to, to I would say, 20 or more things. And there will be a pop quiz. No, there won't. Because if you see this as a checklist, it will simply be something that you've got to do and then check it off the list. Well, I have a good prayer life. I can forget about that now. Oh, I, I challenged someone this week to live according to, to, to what God has called them to live to. I checked it off my list. If you think of it like a checklist, it will become a task. And that is not what Paul wants to do. Paul says these are the fruits that are produced in the life who someone says yes to Christ and yes to the Holy Spirit, and yes to the church. I want to be a son or a daughter of encouragement. I am convinced today the best nickname, the best title we can receive is not pastor. It's not. Or like some people call me here in Clarenville, Father Andrew. I got to say, I like it. It's not pastor. The best thing I can be called today, the best thing you can be called today, is someone who encourages. That when someone leaves your presence, they say, I always feel better when I go. When they want to give you a call. Or when they see you walking over to you in church, not going, oh no, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? But they say, oh man, how are you? Today, as we finish this series in the book of Thessalonians, Paul begins by reminding them who they are. Paul begins his letter by saying, listen, we heard about your faith. We heard about your love. We heard about all the good things. And, and, and we know that you're going through a difficult time, but we're going to get through it. And don't give up yet. And, and here are some answers to the questions that you have. I'm trying to help you through this. He begins by emphasizing and acknowledging, wow, you're doing well despite the circumstances. And he ends the letter by saying, 
but don't change the fact that you're called to be encouragers. In this world today, we are living in a chaotic world. We are living in a confusing world. Just go up to St. John's and all those roundabouts. That's very confusing. We are living in a world where some things that were up are now down. Where some things you thought were real are turning out to be false. We're living in a chaotic and confusing world. And it's very easy in this kind of culture, in this kind of situation, what's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen with this? Do you believe the price of that? I can't believe the price of that. You know, all of that is very easy to put on the shell, to become defensive, and dig a hole in the sand and say, I'll come out later. But we are not called to do that. We are called to be sons and daughters of encouragement. Who like to pray. Who want to say yes to what the Spirit is saying and doing. Who want to give honor where it's due. Who wants to be willing to have the tough conversations with people that need to be had. Who want to live a life that pleases God. We want to be a Barnabas. We want to be able to have that heart and produce that fruit. Would you stand with me? I'm going to invite the worship team back. I've really enjoyed this series. I don't know if you liked it, but I have. I've enjoyed this series because it's touched on so many points along the way. And this morning, what I'd like to do, I don't know if we had to get Pastor Julia or not, I'm not sure exactly where she is. All right, thank you, Cheryl. She might be up Mary Brown's having her lunch already. I don't know. I know she's not. What I want to do today is to conclude this service, this time together. I want to give a call to action. I want to give a call to the church today. You might have been here for every sermon. That's great. I was. You might have been only here for a couple. That's all right. This may be the first one you heard in this series. What a good one to come to. But as we sing today, I already feel the Lord is calling us to... Uh, what's the old saying? Put the money where your mouth is. Not just be in lip service only, but to say, Lord, I want to do. So what we're going to do today, I'm going to invite them, I guess, as a worship song you could have. You could have prepared, maybe. Good and Gracious King. I know you practiced that one, correct? Or no? Yeah, we can sing that with a beautiful chorus. What we're going to do, if today you say, Pastor, I want to be a son or a daughter of encouragement. Knowing what I know, Jesus is coming soon. Knowing the fact that he's died for us. Knowing the fact that there's hope for the world. Knowing the fact that we are living in a time and period where Jesus could come. I want to be a son of encouragement. I want to be a daughter of encouragement. I want to encourage the church. I want to encourage those outside the church to come into the fold. I want to be a person who likes to pray. I want to be a person who says yes to the Spirit. I want to be a Barnabas. We need some Barneys and Barneas. If that's you today, as you sing, I want to invite you to come to this altar space. I move right up close because I'm hoping we're going to fill it up. And say, Pastor, I'm committing, not before you, but before God. But I want to be a Barnabas. I want to be a person that encourages, uplifts, and does what God wants me to do. Because, friend, we don't need any more Judases. We don't need any more Simons. We need a lot more Barnabases. Ah, if we could be a church that says, ah, we're full of people. Who he's called a person who is full of faith, the Holy Spirit, and a good man. That's what I want to be today. As we sing, if that's you, Pastor, I want to be a son of encouragement. I want to be a daughter of encouragement. I want to be used by God for God, for his purposes. I want you to come to this altar space. As we sing this morning, I want to pray a blessing over those that come that make this commitment. I approach the throne of God.
thank you for stepping out of that comfort zone because at times that's what it takes to be a Barnabas and before I pray with you I want to give you that charge that Paul gave them rejoice always pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you do not quench what the Spirit is doing what the Spirit is saying do not despise prophecies examine all things firmly hold on to what is good Amen. let go of what is not abstain from all appearances of evil may the very God of peace sanctify you completely and I pray to God that your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless out to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Lord, today I pray a blessing upon those who have stepped out of their seat, those who have stepped out in their hearts today, to say, Lord, I want to be the encourager. I want to be that Barnabas in this world today that is willing to go where you send us, willing to be what you want us to be, willing to do what you want us to do. Lord, I pray a blessing on each of their lives. May your Holy Spirit cover them and seal them in this commitment today. May the enemy of their soul have no foothold today to speak against them and say, why did you come? Why can't you stand? You can't do this. Oh, Lord, may the advocate, the greater one, say unto us, you are covered in our righteousness. You are covered in my peace. You are covered in my power. You are covered by my spirit. Oh, God, set these individuals in places this year, in places this week, to be encouragers. Amen. Give them a fresh touch of your Holy Lord Spirit. Give them a fresh Praise voice you. to hear. Give them, God, ears to hear what your Spirit is saying. Use them, Lord, in our services together. Lord, make them conduits of your glory, conduits of your speaking, conduits of your presence. Lord, each of them have trials and challenges that they will face. Each of them are in unique places. But today we all commit, we all commit to be that Barnabas, to be that person, to help others do the right thing. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. Church, can we just worship the Lord before I say amen? Can we just lift up our hands and our voice and say thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, work in your church. Work in your church. Work through your church this morning. Oh, Yeah.
God's so sweet. Gorgeous. Oh, it's so good to be in his presence. Today you've committed to this. He will see to that it gets done. Lord, bless us now as your people. Let your spirit rest upon us. May he move us and shape us and make us this week. Lord, our greatest desire is to be used for your glory, used for your honor. So, Father, whatever it takes, change our heart, change our mind. Put our hands to work today. Bless us now as we prepare to go. Protect those who are driving on the highway. Keep them safe, oh God. For that individual here this morning, who this whole service, the enemy of their soul, has been taunting them. The Lord would say to you in this moment, I break the chains. Listen to my voice. That's what he would say to you today. Listen to my voice. I break the chains. Listen to my voice. You do not need to give clearance and credence to the voice of the enemy. For that person today, church, I just, for that person today, that um, your anxiety this week has been much higher than usual. Your anxiety this week, your, your fear this week as you don't understand, it's just much higher than usual. I don't know who you are, but the Lord is saying to you, my peace I leave with you. You're going to make it through. Yes. But my peace I give to you. Yes. It's yours today. I, I can't say amen just yet, church. I'm sorry. I really believe the Lord is working. I, I really do. I, I don't. Someone has to say yes to the Spirit this morning. I can't say amen. I don't know. I don't know if someone on the worship team with a word or something. I don't. feelings this morning I went on a promise that was made to me a long time ago and uh, I've been blessed this morning Amen Amen, let's walk on that promise as he's made Let's sing this chorus one more time and then I'll say amen, I'll let you go maybe Let's sing this one more time You deserve the greater glory You deserve the greater glory
Let it be, O oh God. Let it happen according to your will. Lord, we're ready. We're ready for what you want to do in us and through us. So today we just simply say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, church family.